Well, welcome, church family. Welcome to September. Hard to believe. Yeah, you know, I just remember as as a kid and hearing the old folks say, yeah, time just seems to fly by, and as a kid, you don't realize it. Now I'm one of the old folks. Time is just flying by. So did you get done everything this summer that you wanted to do? No? Anybody? Got all the trips in that you wanted to take? All the projects around the house that you wanted to fulfill? Anybody? Maybe get them all done? Good. Some of them checked off quite a few. You know, just I was thinking about this the other day, that um, for the past 12 years, on my summer to-do list was paint the house. Didn't get done, so we finally just moved. <laughs> and then I realized yesterday, you know what, this house needs to be painted. <laughs> so it's on my checklist for next summer. We're going to get that house painted. But, but isn't that the way it goes? I mean, we just, we have good intentions, we have good plans, but... But life just gets busy and it flows by. And we just let it flow by. You know, it's part of our theme this whole year. We started the year with the theme. You see it out on the wall in the gathering area. Live your life on purpose. So we want to live our lives on purpose. And that's really counter. That's the opposite of what we often do. And just kind of living our lives on autopilot. You know what I mean by that? That we just get up every day and we do what that day demands and we meet the emergencies of the day and we we handle the demands of the day but it just seems like one day flows into another day and we just get so busy doing the demands of the day that we we just kind of go on autopilot and we do what we have to do and we accomplish what we have to accomplish but we don't give any thought to what it is that we really are accomplishing or or setting a new direction and accomplishing what we really want to accomplish. And we get so busy with just every day, the day by day, the hour by hour, that, that time just flows by and pretty soon we find that summer's over and the weather begins to change and there's a chill in the air and kids get to go back to school and there's football. And then that flows by and we're in winter and then it happens again and again and again. And you know, we just we just go and do what we have to do and we're in a sense on autopilot. Now, the problem with that is that we really don't give a lot of thought to our actions when we are on autopilot. That we we just kind of go through the motions and go through our day and there's no thoughts to our actions and 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 we could we could say in terms of there's the thoughtless actions that just take place in our life. It's the things that we do every day. And we really don't give any thought to, does this thing that I find myself doing every day, does it help me or does it hinder me in my relationship with Christ? Is this urging me on and and spurring me on to be more like Jesus? Is this helping me grow up as a Christian or is it in fact hindering me? keeping me from growing up as a Christian. But we're just so used to doing what we always do, we don't even give any thought to that, and so we just keep doing what we always do. And, you know, as we think about that in our lives and, and living our life on purpose, we really need to apply that to our, our religious activities, our church things. And we recognize even in our church things, these are good things, things that we know we should do and we do, but do we give any thought as to why we do them? Because we're pretty good at just doing what we think we need to do. We just do them and we don't give a lot of thought to them. Here's the problem with that. It's a statement that I I think just rings true. These things that we always do become our rituals, but rituals without reason become empty routines. We, we keep doing these things, and especially in our church life, our, our church things, we do them. There's, there's probably a good reason why we do them, but we don't give any thought to it. And we've kind of lost sight of why we do what we do. We just do them. And we do them without an understanding of the reason of what we do, but rituals without reason become empty routine. You know, sometimes we, um, maybe it's just me, kind of think, critically of uh, of those 
church religious traditions that follow a more liturgical form of worship. That there's that set pattern that they do every Sunday, and there's the standing up, and there's the kneeling, and there's the prayer, and there's the response, and they do the same thing every Sunday. And we look at that and say, wow, if you'd only understand what you were doing, it would be so much more meaningful, but you just do it as a matter of routine. It's an empty routine. And then being critical of that, realize that, man, we have the same routine. Different, different routine, but really we have our own liturgy. We do the same things every Sunday. I don't know if you do this, but if I'm away, away from this church family on Sunday, and, and I'll look at my watch and say, you know what, it's about oh, 1127, and right about now Marcus is starting the sermon. I can look at my watch and say, right now the praise team is up. They're probably on their second of three songs. Up oh, Now the offering's being taken. Oh, kids are going down. And, and you can watch just by knowing the clock what's happening in our church because we do the same thing. We have our routine. And they're good things. Our routine are good things, but if we lose sight of the reason that we do it, those good things, that, those rituals just become empty routines. And here's the problem with empty routines. Empty routines will very seldom result in richness. We want our lives to be rich in Christ. We want to grow in our knowledge of Christ, to know him, to be known by him, known as his, to know the wonder of of the gospel. And, And to grow in that and to thrill in that. But you know what? That richness very seldom comes by simply going through a empty routine and that's part of our theme for the year this idea of we just want to grow in that we want to live our lives on purpose and so these things that we do do them for a reason it's not that we have to change everything we do routine is not bad but when we forget why we do it then it becomes empty so we want to grow in that and understand what it is that we do and what should we be doing this morning, we're actually going to launch into a, a new series. And, and it's born out of this idea that we're going to live our lives on purpose. And so if we're going to live our lives on purpose, that statement itself just makes us realize that there are some things that we probably should be doing. And there are probably some things that we should give attention to. And we're going to look at some of those things that we should be doing and give our attention to Not as a matter of just adding to our routine, but to do that with a purpose, to do these things deliberately, that we live our Christian life deliberately. And when we do that, there are some things that we should pursue, some actions, some attitudes, some values, some characteristics that we desire. I want to start this, and I want to launch this by going to Ephesians in chapter 2. So, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, that's in the New Testament. New Testament starts with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then there's a book of history, which is called the book of Acts. It's the Acts of the Apostle. And then a series of letters. First of all, the, the letters written by Paul and to the Romans and then to the Corinthians and then to the Galatians, Ephesians. In chapter 2, and Paul just unfolding this after... The first chapter, oh, what a wonderful, soaring chapter that is, as Paul just once again reminds us of the wonder of the gospel, the wonder of what God has done for us. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to the adoption of sons. And and that soaring truth, several times in that opening statement, he uses the phrase in, in some form, to the praise of his glory. Why does he do that? Because it brings glory to who he is. And then, kind of as a, a summing up of that and, and just really drilling down in that, there is the reminder that all of this was done because of who God is. It's because of his grace and not because of what we do. And so there's that statement in 8 and 9 that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not the result of works. But then verse 10, and that's where I want to focus in here for a moment. Verse 10 of chapter 2 just says this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, it, it, first glance, that seems like a little bit of a contradiction because we're not saved by works, but we're saved and there should be good works. We want to kind of focus in here to what Paul is saying and use this as the foundation as we launch into that new series. And we're calling the series, you've seen it in the bulletin, Created For. There are certain things that we are created for and things that we want to be true in our lives and things that we need to pursue to be true in our lives. But as we launch it here with this verse, there are three things that I want you to notice here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Again, it reads this way. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Three things. And the first is that we are created for our lives to go in a certain and a specific direction. Think about that for a minute. We were created for a reason. We were created with the idea and the design that our lives would go in a certain direction. And when Paul says it here, we're saved by faith, saved by grace through faith, and it's because of Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross. When he says that we are created, for these good works, we could read that a couple different ways. One, and, and they both are true, by the way, but from the very beginning, when God first determined that he was going to create us, when God said, let us make man in our image, he determined that we were going to go. Our life should go in a specific direction. It should be characterized by this thing. And when he says that uh, we were created in Christ Jesus, by the way, we know that Jesus was intimately involved in creation. If we go back to the first chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing has come into being. That actually has come into being. And who is this Word? Well, he was made flesh, and he dwelt among us. It's Jesus. He was intimately involved in creating us for a purpose that our life would go in a direction. And then redeeming us, and really that's kind of the context that we have here, that he redeemed us. We are, we are saved from our sin. We're saved from the condemnation and the penalty of our rebellion so that our lives could once again go in a certain direction. See, God didn't create us and then just send us off on our own to do our own thing. And Jesus didn't redeem us so that we might be free from the consequence of sin so that we can go and do our own thing. Paul reminds us that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Saved for a reason. Now, as we, we talk about this, we're going to get to some specifics in a while. But when we talk about this and we talk about, talk about save for good works that God has prepared beforehand, really fight the temptation to think in terms of a grand assignment. Sometimes we like to think that way, and sometimes even when we talk about, well, and I, I wish I could just know the will of God for my life. We, we're kind of thinking in terms of, whoa, what's my grand assignment? What, what's God want me to do? He saved me for a good work. What is my good work? What's that grand assignment that he wants me to do? Maybe he wants me to be a preacher. Maybe he wants me to be a successful businesswoman. Maybe he wants me just to be a, a, an incredible dad. Now, what's my grand assignment? Well, God may call you to some of those things. But this really isn't about your grand assignment. And by the way, knowing the will of God for your life is a lot simpler than knowing that grand assignment. You know what will of God is? that you would listen and obey. And, and if you're listening right now and you obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you're in the will of God. And if you do that step by step, he's going to lead you where he wants you to go. Knowing the will of God for your life isn't all that mysterious. He wants you to listen and obey to the praise of his glory. And when you do that, he directs you where he wants you to go. So when we talk about this idea of being his workmanship, created for good works, what he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Really, it, it's not so much the focus of, okay, what is God going to call me to in the future? The idea is right now be focused on his voice. Don't forget to be about what he wants you to do right now. 
So there's a direction. There's a characteristic. There's a value. There's a priority that should be evident in your life because he's created you for that and he's redeemed you for that. Second thing that I want you to notice here is that the way that we live our lives should reflect who he is. The way we live our lives should reflect, be a reflection of who he is. Look again at the verse here. For we are his workmanship. Now, stop there, that that idea, workmanship. If we were readers in Greek, we would see that that Greek word is peia, peema, which may not mean anything if you're not a reader of Greek. But it has this idea of something that is carefully and skillfully crafted. By the way, what should that do for your self-esteem? Where's your value and your worth? It's not in what you're able to accomplish. It's not in what you're able to provide for yourself. It's not the riches that you are able to amass. You know what makes you valuable? Because you are carefully and skillfully crafted by a God who loves you. You are his workmanship. You are his masterpiece his master work of art. And, and think about how incredible that is because you think of all of the scope of creation, and there are some pretty amazing things in creation. But those things are never described as his masterpiece. Think about the heavens and the stars and the galaxies and the universe. Incredible to look at. That's not his workmanship. That's not his masterpiece. You think about the vastness of the ocean and the beauty of, of this physical world and the grandeur that is true there. And then you think of, of the microscopic and how incredibly detailed those things that we can't see with the naked eye. Just how wonderful and complex. You know what? That's, that's not his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. thing with that idea, though, and we often use this idea with, with, on a human level with artists, Often we say, you know, you can see something of the artist in the artwork. And those who study art or study a specific artist say, you know, this, in this painting we, we really see the personality coming through. You know, here's, here's a painting that was done in a, in a time of, of intense personal struggle and we see the struggle coming through in the artwork. And they study the artwork and, and, and say we can know something of the artist by looking at what they created. Well, if that's true on a human level, how much more on the divine level? And I think that's really what that is getting to here, that we are his workmanship. We're created for good works in Christ Jesus, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why? Because it reflects who he is. And our life should reflect who he is, that that people would be able to see something and understand something about the God who created you by the way that you live. And you know why? To the praise of his glory. Now, what does that phrase mean? Paul says it several times. It's just kind of becoming a theme for us, too, that we live our lives to the praise of his glory. And, And I would just expand the definition of that so that the wonder and glory of who he is might be seen even more clearly. So that the wonder and glory of who he is might be seen even more clearly. Plug that in when we read this, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that that we should walk in him, walk in them, so that the wonder of who he is might be seen more clearly. The way you live your life should be a reflection of who God is. That's part of, that might be the the big umbrella statement of what what is this good work, what, what does it mean, what are we talking about? That we live our lives on purpose, deliberately, to the praise of his glory. So God is magnified. Should be true. Here's the third thing that I want you to see that um, these things, these good works, should be a natural part of our lives. But sin, sin messed that up. You know, if sin wasn't a problem, 
If sin hadn't entered into creation and began to corrupt and spoil everything that was created perfectly, we wouldn't have a problem living our lives in a way that reflected who God is. But we do live in a world that is corrupted by sin. It's a sin-dominated world, and the, the idea here is that these things don't just happen. We're created that our lives would go in a certain direction, and it should be a reflection of who God is, but because we're in this constant battle with our own sin nature and we live in a world that doesn't necessarily love us because we follow Jesus, it's going to be a struggle. So it's not going to just happen. It's going to happen if we're purposeful and deliberate about living that way. This word here in the verse, this word walk, that we should walk in them, I I think that's an important word that we don't want to skip over. It, it means to, in a sense, if we looked at the full meaning, to encompass this, we walk around it, that this is just the way we carry ourselves, the way we conduct our lives. But when we use the word walk, there's a couple different pictures that we could have in mind. And one is just kind of this leisurely stroll. Just going to go for a walk. And, and we could develop that picture, and it's kind of a pleasant picture to develop. That we just want to walk, we just want to stroll, leisurely stroll with God. It was said of Enoch that he walked with God. How wonderful would that be? We just, just stroll with God. And maybe that idea that the destination isn't so much the importance, but it's just the journey. That we walk with God and we're just so wrapped up in the love of God that we just live our lives and we're just about that. But that's pleasant. It's pleasing to think about. Um. Not necessarily the picture here. It's not a leisurely stroll. Uh, I think of this more in terms of a determined objective hike. It's a hike that has a starting point and a destination in mind. And that doesn't mean that we're unaware of our surroundings. I mean, even when you're on a, on a hike, you, you're going someplace, there's a specific end, you want to accomplish something, and, and even when you're on that kind of walk, you're enjoying what's going on around you and interacting with what's going on. But there's always a purpose. There is always a destination in mind. And with that purpose and that destination in mind, there are often markers, mile markers and and path markers and indications of, of being on the right track and indications of are you progressing on the path. That, I think, is the picture that we have here. This is, this is what we need to walk in. And it's not going to happen if just by letting it happen. It really isn't going to happen by living your life on autopilot. You have to be deliberate. You have to be on purpose about living your life. So the question is, and you're all wondering, well, what are these things? Because I've purposefully been very ba- vague right now. What, what are these characteristics? What are these values? What are the actions that we want to pursue and be diligent and deliberate about? Well, that's, that's what we're going to talk about for the next 10 weeks. We've, we've identified five. And again, every time, I don't know what to call these. Are characteristics, actions, values, something. These five somethings that should be true of us. And really, it's the answer of the question created for the the continuation of the statement created for we are created for five things that we want to look at in the next 10 weeks and you quickly did the math and say oh we're going to spend about two weeks on each one brilliant that's what we're doing i want to have marcus come up and just kind of run through these five things these five somethings and uh briefly describe them but also why why these five and then with that, lead us into a time at the Lord's table. Awesome. How many of you guys have ever been in a situation where uh, someone asks you or maybe you ask them, how's your walk with the Lord going? It's a great question to ask somebody. Maybe it's an accountability partner, maybe someone in your small group, maybe a close friend or your spouse. Uh, but you get asked that question. And for me, I know personally, but even sometimes asking students, you know, good. And then, then I'll always ask the follow-up question because I, I always give our students a hard time that one-word responses are not adequate responses. So uh, I'll ask, well, why do you feel that way? You 
What, what's, your, what's your reason for why you think things are going well in your relationship with the Lord? And that's a lot harder answer. Our assessment of how we're doing in our walk with the Lord, of if we're growing or if we're stagnant, it's really hard, I would argue, sometimes to, to gauge and measure. And there's times where we know I'm clearly walking in a direction God doesn't want for me, and we can have some clarity to recognize that. But whether we're actually growing and pursuing the things God wants for us is a little bit more challenging. And so really uh, what we want to focus on for the next 10 weeks is what can we do to assess in our life to make sure we are heading in the direction that God wants us to be going? How do we know if we're growing in our walk with the Lord? Uh, a few months back as elders, we, we took what we called a, a spiritual health assessment. And really the, the five we're going to call them qualities for right now. The five qualities that we're going to focus on was really the five cat qualities that uh, this spiritual health assessment uh, summed up. A healthy Christian is going to grow in each of these areas. And so these qualities, the first one is this whole idea of worship, that we were created for worship. I think of this idea of worship, it's this idea of wholeheartedly giving ourselves to the Lord. Every aspect of our life, we are coming before the Lord, we're giving that to Him, we are lining our heart with God's heart, and uh, again, that we are holding nothing back. We are all to the glory of God. We are all to worshiping Him. Worship is not just a time of singing like we have our, our routine of three to four songs on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening. Worship is a heart that is in tune with God's heart. Worship is a heart that, uh, again, freely offers all to the Lord. So we want to spend, again, a couple weeks really focusing on that idea of what is worship? What is my response to who God is? And if we are growing, we should see a heart that is continuing to be more in tune with God's heart. There's some specific things, and we'll get into this every time we hit a new topic in this, but there's some specific things we can ask ourselves and we can really focus on to identify, am I actually taking steps forward to grow in this quality of worship? Uh, after worship, we're going to look at this overall quality of ministry. We are created for ministry. A synonym for ministry is we are created for serving the Lord. And so when we think about serving, we think about ministry, uh, two of the main overarching topics within that we're, we're going to cover is we're created to minister within the church and outside of the church. And I'm not saying those are mutually exclusive, but we see very clearly in Scripture we each have spiritual gifts, we each have passions, we have skills, we have, uh, again, qualities that God wants us to use to bless His church. How are we doing at serving Him in that capacity? We think outside of the church, what does our roles in the community look like to serve and bless those around us? How are we ministering to our neighbors, to our friends, again, to those who we interact with regularly? How are we using the gifts and the skills and passions God has given to us to bless other people? Again, are we growing? Are we taking steps forward in those areas? Uh, discipleship will be another quality that we will focus on. How are we doing at becoming more and more like Jesus? I appreciate as pastor was saying that uh, a part of these good works is that we will reflect the one who has created us. That's a great example of discipleship, of learning from Jesus and becoming more and more like Jesus. Within that, though, we also understand that not only are we supposed to be disciples, we are also to make disciples. Think about as parents raising up your children. So you think about uh, trying to mentor a friend or a neighbor or a loved one. How are we doing at discipling others so that they are growing in their faith? They are being more and more like Christ because of the influence that we are having in their life. If we are called to make disciples, a way that we can measure if we're growing is, are we making disciples? Uh, we're going to spend uh, actually three weeks, because our missions conference is sandwiched right in the middle of this, but on evangelism. We first need to understand, okay, what does that mean to share our faith and then how can we do it? Personally, as, uh, as pastors and elders, we were talking about this, that this is really one of those areas as a church we feel we need to grow in. 
we, we really do feel like we need to grow in this. And uh, just personally, uh, I often, I know the gospel message. I know the content of that. I don't say that arrogantly. I could give you the ABCs of what it is that the, go- what the gospel is and what someone needs to know to be saved. I could quote scripture to you. I could, I could do all of those things. But when it comes to bringing it up in a conversation, and even more so inviting a response from somebody, encouraging someone to come to the Lord because they need Christ and He loves them. I struggle with that. And as a church, how can we take steps forward individually and collectively to where we are growing in evangelism? Lastly, we're going to focus on fellowship. One of the things that also we were talking is, do we value enough the deep relationships that are possible within our church? Think about that question. Do you personally value enough the deep relationships that can be built within our church family? Because that takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes vulnerability to develop a deep relationship with somebody. And yet, what God can use uh, through that type of relationship to help sanctify one another, to help encourage each other to grow, is priceless. And so we want to talk about how do we we develop deeper relationships, and uh, are we pursuing that to a degree that is really going to help us grow in our faith? Again, we don't want to just say if we do A, B, C, D, and E, we are going to be the perfect Christians, and that's the, the whole formula for us, and it's laid out perfectly. It's not what we're saying. There's more qualities that we could unpack, but as we think about, are we actually growing in our faith? I really do think that these qualities are good measuring rods for us to know, are we taking steps forward? Are we becoming more like Christ? Are we, we growing closer to Jesus? As Pastor mentioned, we really have to be careful with this because if we go back to Ephesians 2.10 and we look at verses 8 and 9, again, it very clearly says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. These qualities, uh, being a disciple of Jesus, sharing our faith, uh, serving other people, these in and of themselves are not what makes you a Christian. These are not what saves you from your sin. Nothing else can save us from our sin but the grace of God. It's through faith in what Christ has done for us. But because of that, we are saved to do these things. We are saved to live out our life in a purposeful way where we are growing in our faith. It's one of those mornings as I, I was sitting here and we we're singing songs that, uh, uh, and even as Brian was sharing, just felt that the Lord was, was bringing some passages to mind. And I think this is a situation where I think my ideas are connected, and I hope I'm not alone in that, that thinking. Okay? Uh, but uh, this morning, I was reading, also going through Psalms right now, Brian, and I was reading Psalm 18. And it was one of those Psalms where it's, it's a lengthier Psalm than most other ones um, I read the first verse, and I don't think it was because I was being lazy or in a rush, but I just I couldn't read more than the first verse. It just it stood out to me. It captured my attention, and this is all that it says. I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love you, O Lord, my strength. And I just, I paused, and I was sitting there, and I just realized, okay, this is David. He's speaking. He's in a situation where... In, He's experiencing opposition and struggle and God is delivering him and saving him and preserving him in the midst of it. And his response is simply this, I love you, Lord, my strength. Why do we want to grow in the first place? Why do we want to live in a way where we know we are created to do these things, to live a certain way, to follow the direction Christ has for us? Why do we want to do that in the first place? I go back, and here's where the line of thinking started. I go back to one of my favorite verses, but it's also a very challenging one. John 14, 15. Jesus is speaking, and he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, we don't want to be 
uh, rigid and just say that following Jesus is simply obeying commandments. It's not at all, I think, what the, the point of following Christ is. But if we love Jesus, we will do the things he calls us to do. If we love Jesus, we will follow the direction he wants us to go. And we're going to waver, we're going to struggle. And yet if we truly love him, that is going to be true of us. Then I think of 1 John and the overall theme that we love God because he first loved us. That overall theme of if we want to grow, it starts from this foundation of do we love God? Because that is the motivator that is going to help us more than anything else. And it's founded in the fact that he loved us first. But if we really do love him, that shows up in the fact that we are going to live deliberately. We are going to live in a way where we are striving to grow, where we are sharing our faith with other people, where we are serving, we are worshiping, we are devoting all that we are to who God is. This morning we get to end really celebrating the biggest demonstration of God's love for us. That he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life for us so that he could die on the cross to pay the price for our sin. And that sin separated us from God, but when we, by faith, because of God's grace, when we accept that Jesus died and rose again, we can be forgiven, and we can have a relationship with God. That's the gospel message, and that is really what we celebrate in communion. That the body we read in 1 Corinthians 11 is, again, Jesus' body, the bread is Jesus' body that was broken for. The juice is Jesus' blood that was spilled for us. It is His doing on our behalf so that we could receive God's grace. It is His doing on our behalf so that we could be restored to a relationship with Him. Can I just ask you, if you are here, you've never responded to that. You're sitting here and you maybe have grown up and have heard about Jesus in some capacity, but you have never recognized that you need a Savior. You need your sin forgiven. You need to be restored. You need to be changed. Can I plead with you that Jesus died for you and he loves you? And he wants relationship with you? And through faith in what he did for you, you can be forgiven and you can be made whole. When I plead with you, all it takes is not just saying these words, but truly believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and he is the Lord of your life and he will forgive you if you believe in what he's done for you. If you confess with your mouth that he is the Lord of your life, you believe in your heart that he died and rose again, you will be saved even today. And this is such a great celebration for us. And as a church, what we welcome is that anyone who has made that decision, anyone who has believed Jesus died for their sin and rose again, is welcome to take this with us. Um, If you go to a different church, but you believe in Jesus and you've made that decision, we don't care about which church you go to. The foundation is, do you know Christ as your Savior? And so we welcome you to celebrate with us as we take that today. I want to invite our elders to to come up.